Namaskar. A warm welcome to World News and Indian Perspective on All India Radio. This is Manoj Singh Rana and with me is VC Pramod, bringing glimpses of the major developments of the day from across the globe. Over the next half an hour, we shall bring you the latest from the world of politics, economy, sports, entertainment and more. The headlines. Tokyo Olympics bound first batch of Indian athletes to depart from New Delhi shortly. Afghan Foreign Ministry summons Pakistani ambassador and lodges strong protest over abduction of the daughter of Afghanistan's ambassador to Islamabad. World must have confidence in the governance in Afghanistan for reliable connectivity, says External Affairs Minister of India. US sanctioned seven officials in China's Hong Kong liaison office issues business advisory cautioning US businesses in Hong Kong. Devastating floods in Western Europe leave at least 150 people dead. India's COVID-19 vaccination coverage crosses landmark milestone of 40 crore doses. And Sydney enters stricter city-wide lockdown as COVID-19 cases rise. As the nationwide free COVID-19 vaccination campaign at government facilities for those above 18 years is underway, we advise our young listeners to get vaccinated and also to help others to get vaccinated. We also advise our listeners not to lower their guard as COVID-19 remains a threat to our health. Please stay at home unless it is essential to go out and continue to follow these three simple steps. Wear a face mask. Maintain Dogas Ki Duri for social distancing and focus on hand and face hygiene. For any COVID-related information and guidance, contact National Helpline numbers 011-2397-8046 and 1075. And now the news in detail. India's Youth Affairs and Sports Minister Anurag Thakur and Minister of State for Sports Nishit Pramanik addressed the first batch of Indian athletes bound for Tokyo Olympics from New Delhi. A formal send-off ceremony took place at New Delhi's Indira Gandhi International Airport. The contingent of 88 include 54 athletes, support staff and Indian Olympic Association representatives. Athletes and support staff in eight sports including archery, hockey, badminton, table tennis, judo, gymnastics and weightlifting will depart from New Delhi with largest contingent being of hockey. Our correspondent reports that 127 Indian athletes have qualified for the Tokyo Olympics as compared to the figure of 117 that qualified for the Rio Olympics. Earlier, interacting with Indian athletes, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that the country will cheer for them. मुझे ये देखकर खुशी होती है कि देश आपको चीयर कर रहा है 135 करोड़ भारतीयों की शुभकामनाएं खेल के मैदान में उतरने से पहले आप सभी के लिए देश का आशीर्वाद है मैं भी अपनी ओर से आपको ढेर सारी शुभकामनाएं देता हूं ये बात जरूर याद रखना है कि जीतने का प्रेशर लेकर नहीं खेलना है अपने दिल दिमाग को बस एक ही बात कहिए कि मुझे अपना बेस्ट परफॉर्म करना है मैं देशवासियों से भी एक बार फिर कहूंगा चीयर फॉर इंडिया मुझे पूरा विश्वास है आप सब देश के लिए खेलते हुए देश का गौरव बढ़ाएंगे नए मुकाम हासिल The Afghan Foreign Ministry summoned the Ambassador of Pakistan to Kabul, Mr. Mansoor Ahmad Khan, this afternoon and launched a strong protest over the abduction of the daughter of Afghanistan's Ambassador to Islamabad. In a statement, the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs asked Mr. Khan to convey the strong protest and deep concerns about this grave incident. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs explicitly called on the Pakistani government to take immediate action to identify and punish the perpetrators of this crime and ensure the full security and immunity of Afghan diplomats and their families in accordance with international conventions. The statement said that Ms. Silsila Alikil was abducted for several hours in Islamabad on Friday, the 25th of this month, and was released after being tortured. Meanwhile, representatives of the Afghan government and the Taliban met in Doha for talks on Saturday. 
According to reports, several high-ranking officials, including former Afghan chief executive Abdullah Abdullah, gathered in a hotel on Saturday. They were joined by negotiators from the Taliban's political office in Doha. Najia Anwari, the spokeswoman for the Afghan government negotiating team in Doha, said that the high-level delegation is in Doha to talk to both sides, guide them and support the government negotiating team in terms of speeding up the talks and making progress. The Taliban has capitalized on the last stages of the withdrawal of the U.S. and other foreign troops from Afghanistan to launch a series of lighting offenses across the country. Pakistan partially reopened its side of the southern border, crossing with Afghanistan on Saturday. Pakistan had shut after the Taliban seized control of the strategic Afghan frontier town of Spin Boldak from government forces last week. There have been weeks of intensifying fighting across Afghanistan, with the Taliban pressing multiple offences and overrunning dozens of districts at a staggering rate. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar has said that the world must have confidence in the governance in Afghanistan for reliable connectivity within and throughout the country. Making his remarks at the plenary session of the Central and South Asia Connectivity on Friday, Dr. Jay Shankar said that development and prosperity go hand in hand with peace and security. He added that India has taken practical steps to operationalize the Chabahar port in Iran. He welcomed the formation of India-Uzbekistan-Iran-Afghanistan quadrilateral working group on the joint use of Chabahar port. The minister also informed that India has proposed to include the Chabahar port in the framework of the International North-South Transport Corridor, INSTC. INSTC is a multimodal transportation route linking the Indian Ocean and Persian Gulf to the Caspian Sea via Iran and onward to Northern Europe via St. Petersburg in Russia. The C5 plus 1 countries reaffirmed their commitment to strengthen connectivity between the Central and South Asian regions via trade, transport and energy links. The C5 plus 1 group comprises Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and the United States of America. In a joint statement, the C5 plus 1 recognized that increased connectivity supports the shared goal of a prosperous and secure Central Asia. The U.S. has issued an advisory cautioning U.S. businesses about emerging risks to their operations and activities in Hong Kong. The U.S. has imposed sanctions on seven of China's officials. The move comes in response to Beijing's hardening stance on democracy in Hong Kong. The seven targeted individuals are part of China's Hong Kong liaison office, which seeks to promote Beijing's influence in the territory. The U.S. Department of State in a statement said that many of the risks stem from the implementation of China's national security law in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region and other recent legislative changes. The statement added that developments over the last year in Hong Kong present clear operational, financial, legal and reputational risks for multinational firms. The statement said that China's policies undermine the legal and regulatory environment that is critical for individuals and businesses to operate freely and with legal certainty in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that China and Hong Kong officials have systematically undermined Hong Kong's democratic institutions, delayed elections, disqualified elected lawmakers from office and forced officials to take loyalty oaths to keep their jobs. Marking one year of Hong Kong's national security law, Mr. Blinken said that since protests began in 2019, journalists have been arrested simply for doing their jobs and reporting on the government's activities and repressive efforts against protesters. The statement referring to the forced closure of Apple Daily said that Hong Kong authorities have mounted a persistent and politically motivated campaign against the free press and imprisoned its founder, Jimmy Lai. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. The centre is disseminating awareness of national helpline numbers for the benefit of citizens during the COVID-19 pandemic. The helpline number of the Health and Family Welfare Ministry is 1075. The child helpline number is 1098. For senior citizens of Delhi, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh and Uttarakhand, the helpline number is 14567. 
द हेल्प लाइन नंबर ऑफ नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मेंटल हेल्थ एंड न्यूरो साइंसेज नीम हंस फॉर साइकोलॉजिकल सपोर्ट इज जीरो एट जीरो फोर सिक्स डबल वन ट्रिपल जीरो सेवन आयुष कोविड नाइन्टीन काउंसिलिंग हेल्प लाइन नंबर इज वन ट्रिपल फोर थ्री एंड माई गोव व्हाट्सएप हेल्प डेस्क नंबर इज India's COVID-19 vaccination coverage crossed a landmark milestone of 40 crore doses as per the 7 pm provisional report more than 46.38 lakh vaccine doses have been administered on saturday 21 lakh 18682 vaccine doses were administered as first dose and 2 lakh 33019 vaccine doses were given as second dose in the age group of 18 to 44 years on saturday Meanwhile member health in Niti Aayog Dr V K Paul has said that the next 100 to 125 days are critical in the fight against covid-19 briefing media on friday he said the world is moving towards a third wave of covid and recalled that prime minister narendra modi has mentioned this as a warning against complacency now let's take a look at the coronavirus updates from around the world Bangladesh reported 204 deaths and 8489 fresh corona cases on the third day of the 9 day long relaxation in the lockdown restrictions in the country on Saturday according to latest figures released by DGHS on Saturday the sample positivity rate was reported at 29.06% marking a rise from 28.69% on Friday and 27.23% on Thursday Leaders of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Group APEC including US President Joe Biden and Russia's Vladimir Putin have pledged to work to expand sharing and manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines to fight the global pandemic. After a virtual meeting chaired by New Zealand, the leaders said in a joint statement that they would encourage the voluntary transfer of vaccine production technologies on mutually agreed terms. as the region prepared for future health shocks the apac leaders met virtually to discuss collective actions to navigate the covid-19 pandemic and its economic impacts new zealand prime minister jacinda ardern said that the discussions moved them beyond vaccine nationalism the australian city of sydney ordered a shutdown of building sites banned non essential retail and threatened fines for employers who make staff come into the office as new covid-19 cases kept rising 3 weeks in a city wide lockdown The World Health Organization WHO on Friday proposed a fresh coronavirus investigation in China and an audit of its labs over the origin of the virus. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on the WHO's proposal for a probe into the origin of COVID-19 from China. Despite the WHO's first report from Wuhan concluding that COVID-19 was likely transmitted to humans from animals, now the UN agency WHO has again proposed that there could be a second China probe into virus origin, including audit of Wuhan labs. Mr. Anita, why do you think that there is a need to have another probe? Is it the pressure from many countries in the world, or is it like many countries have said that Chinese have escaped? you know from this detailed probe and uh, chinese government lab probe has been premature why do you think uh, there is a fresh demand to have this inspection and this probe into the origins of the virus from china sanjay there are several reasons for that number 1 you see the first theory which came out was that your sars cov 2 which is your uh, covid 19 resulted from natural causes right and uh, like sars 1 i'll give you a small example SARS-1 has been established that it came from natural causes that we had a full trail from the origin to the transmission to human that it originated in bats and it jumped to one small animals called crevets and from crevets it came to humans so we have the full sequence of SARS-1 similarly another coronavirus which is MERS we again have the full sequence of that originates in bats jumps to camels and camels to humans so that's established that these both these viruses or both these coronaviruses were the result of natural causes but we cannot establish that trail in the case of sars cov 2 that we know that it's finally arrived at humans but we're not sure i mean it's probably originated in bats but how did it jump to the second species and reach here so there's no there is nothing established in terms of the chain that it resulted from natural causes that's number 1 
second thing is that there are other reports which are come out. For example, Wall Street Journal quoting a U.S. intelligence report has alleged that there were six people working in the Wuhan Institute of Virology where this great gain of function experiments were being done. I'll explain what these are. And that these six died in November of symptoms which resembled very closely to the symptoms if you're infected with COVID-19, which gave rise to the speculation or the hypothesis that it perhaps originated in this lab, that is COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, and it took, and there were people who were infected by this much before the Chinese declared that such an eventuality had arisen, that is COVID-19 has come about, which was on December 31st. So there is uh, this report itself which came about, which in a sense, if there is speculation, if this is true, then there is a demand for medical records of these people which the Chinese are not willing to give. So therefore, because we are in the gray zone over here, then again, there is a reason as to why we should have a, a second probe. There are two causes, two reasons why there should be a second probe. And third, you see, when the first probe took place, the team should have been handed over, you know, your computer files and all the records of the experiments that were being done in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which were not shared. Why were they not shared? There's enough reason again to say that probably there is something which the Chinese might have to hide. So these are some of the reasons as to why there is a demand. And there's a final reason which uh, I would like to dilate upon. You see, it is well known that gain of function experiments, which is a genetic modification of coronaviruses, was being done in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. In fact, there's this lady called Shi Jungli. She was in charge of actually enhancing, exactly gain of function means that you have, let's say, SARS-1. You will modify it, add a spike to it. That's, you know, that's a gain of function. Now, why you do it, there's a reason for that, that you want to see whether certain viruses will mutate over time. So you do it in laboratory conditions so that you can have antidotes and medicines which can be developed by nature. So these are the experiments which are being done on coronaviruses in uh, Wuhan Institute of Viral. Second, this lady whom I spoke about, Shi Jungli. Shi Jungli was called the bat lady. She would go into the caves of Yunnan, which is a province in China, and collect these samples from bats and bring them to Wuhan Institute of Virology. And that's where they would start the gain of function uh, experiments. She was not alone. This Wuhan Institute of Virology was actually collaborating with the University of North Carolina of, uh, of the United States. And in fact, she generally had herself studied in the University of North Carolina before she decided to join the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Now, it is established that by 2015, enough modifications had been done on the SARS-1. So if they were done by 2015, there is a strong possibility that if you further refine or, you know, develop and continue with this gain-of-function experiments, you could have developed the SARS-CoV-2 as well, which is in the same family. So if that happened, then it's quite likely that some of the, the samples of what was being experimented jumped out of the lab and started uh, infecting people in Wuhan. So since we know that these experiments have been done, there is a reasonable sort of an argument that, you know, further probe is required and whether, you know, we need to go deeper into it, that this may not have been a virus uh, which was uh, came out of natural causes, but is the result of this gain of function experiments, which we know were being carried out. What we don't know is, was SARS-CoV-2 experiment being done or not? Now, that would be something which the investigators should be looking at once they go back and if they're handed over the records by the Chinese government. And only then will we will establish whether or not SARS-CoV-2 was a result of natural causes, theory number one, or was a genetically modified result, which does not mean it's a bioweapon. Now, that will be a third thing which people talk about. But it, there could then be a possibility that it could have been an accident and uh, it could have jumped out of uh, the labs where these gain-of-function experiments were being carried out. You know, you spoke about why there is a need for having another round of investigation. But the many experts... I mean, some of them with the strong ties to WHO said that the political tensions between the U.S. and China make it impossible for an investigation by the agency to find credible answers. And they're also questioning the role of the WHO, you know, I mean, which may be claiming that uh, and drawing up plans for the next phase of its probe, how the coronavirus pandemic started. You may recall the U.S. NSA has said that uh, China risks isolation in quest of you know, coronavirus origin, if Chinese are not going to cooperate, then international community will have to take action against them. So do you think in such a escalating situation between two superpowers, you know, 
Chinese are going to cooperate and help WHO team or there is a need to have another investigation. What is at stake here? Whether or not we are going to have an impartial investigation or will it be a politically driven investigation? I think that's, these are the, this is the crux of the matter. Now, leave geopolitics apart. If we can establish a credible team of experts, scientists of authority and of unimpeachable integrity and have that team, I think that is going to clinch a lot of, uh, you know, going to iron out a lot of problems. Because if you have that quality of people and there is a consensus in the UN Security Council, it's not still gone into the Security Council, but let's say between the Chinese and the American in terms of the team and the impartiality of that team. And if Chinese have nothing to hide, then I don't see why they should object. But I do agree that these tensions make it difficult to identify a team of scientists which will be acceptable to both sides. You know, I mean, we have seen this became a, a debate in American presidential election about investigating the Chinese role in spreading this virus. You know, President Joe Biden has even ordered a review of the U.S. intelligence and have asked them to assess the possibility of checking out this, you know. And I mean, U.S. has also said that it will not solely rely on China and has clearly indicated that America will use the efforts of its intelligence community and allies to press the matter on every front until a result is found. Do you think the world community will ever get to know the reality of how did this virus start it? It has created such a devastating effect all across the world, from rich to the poorest of the poor in the world, you know, uh, from countries like Nepal to the most powerful country on earth like America. Everybody has been severely affected. It has affected the jobs, it has affected the economy, it has affected the public health. So I think the uh, world community owes an explanation from everybody that how did we start and how where did it where did we go wrong, you know, in this twenty first century advance, you know, technologically advanced. Why could not we detect a spread of such a virus? Do you think the world will ever get to know about the reality of this? Sanjay, to be honest, my own gut feeling is that perhaps they will not. And there's a reason why I say so. See, as I mentioned that these gain-of-function experiments were not done by the Chinese alone. There was a very strong American collaboration in the, in these experiments. I mentioned about the University of North Carolina being in. Now, there is funding which is coming from the United States Wuhan Institute of Virology with some public records. So I'm not revealing any kind of a secret. If you dig deeper, you will find as to the institutions in the U.S. which were actually funding these experiments. So I doubt whether the Americans, despite all the pressure they have domestic and otherwise, will really want that the entire story, if it is a story of a gain-of-function experiments gone wrong, ever to come out. I mean, if you recall the statements by Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State, and this he said after he had relinquished office, that is Joe Biden had come and become president. Now his statement is very interesting. He said, Trump had told them to go whole hog and fully investigate whether or not and go to the bottom of it, whether it implicates some people, some universities or powerful people, just go for it. And Pompeo said that the biggest obstacles which I faced in going forward for this investigation was from my own State Department. The people didn't want this murky history of China-US collaboration, which was going on in these fields as well. If you recall, I have spent five years in China, that is from 1920, 2014 to 2020. And I was amazed, it stuck me in Beijing, the, the depth of the collaboration between the Americans and the Chinese, which starts after the Mao era with Deng Xiaoping coming in, and the penetration of Americans, especially in, not only in industry, in terms of investment, but in the universities. I mean, Tsinghua University in Beijing, you have the Black Rock Center, you have and you have Carnegie around. I mean, there's American institutional link-ups with Chinese counterparts is really very, very deep. I doubt whether the Americans would also be interested in this story to come out. So, frankly, to your answer, whether we'll get to the bottom of it, on the face of it, unlikely, but I can't rule out that we will because whatever you may say, truth has its own power and uh, you may find whistleblowers coming from various places. Um, to, but it's difficult. I think to get to the bottom of it is difficult, unlikely, but not impossible. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Aniza. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Sanjay. Thanks for having me. In Western Europe, at least 125 people have lost their lives to the devastating floods. 
countries like Germany and Belgium are witnessing some of the worst floods in decades. According to reports, over 1,000 people are still missing in flood-stricken regions of western Germany and Belgium. Heavy rains also hit Switzerland, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. The Netherlands Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, has declared a national disaster in one southern province. European leaders have blamed the extreme weather on climate change. In Belgium, there were at least 20 dead and another 20 missing, as per the authorities. German President Frank Walter Steinmeier said he was shocked by the devastation caused due to the floods and pledged support for the families of those killed. With only a few days remaining for the first start of the Tokyo Olympics, All India Radio brings a special series on India's medal prospects at the sporting extravaganza. Today we will talk about Archer Praveen. Praveen Jadav is originally from Satara district of Maharashtra. Half of his life was spent in the slums. Praveen Jadav has secured his ticket for the Olympic Games to be held in Tokyo this year by winning a silver medal at the World Championships. Praveen won several medals in the archery competition held in the country, followed by a bronze medal in the men's recurve team event. Representing India for the first time in 2016 Asia Cup competition in Bangkok, today at the strength of his wooden bow, Praveen will go to the Olympics from India in archery. I will there was no looking back for Jadav and now he is going to participate in the Tokyo Olympics for the country. Diksha Saxena, Sports Desk. Shreyans Garde, a resident of Bhilai in Chhattisgarh, is the winner of Friday's edition of the Olympic Quiz with AIR. Shreyansh spoke to AIR News after winning the Olympic Quiz and conveyed his best wishes to the Olympic team. मैं ऑल इंडिया रेडियो को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देना चाहता हूं कि उन्होंने मुझे इस क्विज का विजेता चयनित किया खिलाड़ियों को यह कहना चाहता हूं कि आज जब वे रवाना हो रहे हैं तो वे एक खिलाड़ी के तौर पे जा रहे हैं परंतु जब वे वापस आएंगे तो वे जरूर एक चैंपियन के रूप में आएंगे साथ ही खिलाड़ी कभी यह ना सोचे कि वे स्टेडियम में अकेले परफॉर्म कर रहे हैं उनके साथ पूरा देश है 130 करोड़ भारतीय साथ खड़े हैं और हमें भरोसा है कि इस बार जरूर इतिहास रचा जाएगा जय हिंद all India Radio's Olympic quiz was launched on the 1st of this month and has received a tremendous response from across the country. Hundreds of listeners have emailed their responses. To take part in the Olympic quiz, tune in to the SportsCan program. The 17th of July is observed across the globe as the World Day for International Justice to mark an emerging modern system of justice against international criminal acts. The day marks the coming together of people from all walks of life to support the idea of justice, victims' rights and most importantly, ensuring the prevention of crime that jeopardizes peace. The day is also a reminder of the significance of social justice for the underprivileged and oppressed. It reminds states as well as civil society of the need for their commitment to the international justice system. The day commemorates the establishment of the International Criminal Court, ICC, following the adoption of the Rome Statute. A quick look at the headlines once again. Tokyo Olympics bound first batch of Indian athletes to depart from New Delhi shortly. Afghan's foreign ministry summons Pakistani ambassador and lodges strong protest over abduction of the daughter of Afghanistan's ambassador to Islamabad. World must have confidence in the governance in Afghanistan for reliable connectivity, says External Affairs Minister of India. U.S. sanctions seven officials in China's Hong Kong liaison office, issues business advisory cautioning U.S. businesses in Hong Kong. Devastating floods in Western Europe have at least left 150 people dead. And India's COVID-19 vaccination coverage crosses landmark milestone of 40 crore doses. Sydney enters stricter citywide lockdown as COVID-19 cases rise. India is celebrating the 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan, Deshnav Jan, by Artis from Uzbekistan. And 
with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.